Sound check, can you hear me at the back? Yeah. <laughs> right, well you all have to settle down and be quiet. My name is Duncan Brack, I'm editor of the Journal of Liberal History, uh, among other things, and welcome to this meeting of the Liberal Democrat History Group. Um, now, as a history group, we like historical traditions, so I have to tell you that Paddy has to leave early, and <laughs> Shirley is arriving late. <laughs> 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 we won't be starting with Shirley. Now, the meeting has two purposes. First of all, to launch our latest book, Peace, Reform and Liberation, A History of Liberal Politics in Britain, 1679 to 2011. Hot off the press, only got printed last week. Um, now, there are a few other single volume histories of the party uh, in existence, but none of them go back as far as 1679 or stretch up to July of this year, which this one does. And we also think they're not very good in between. <laughs> Unless we've sold that already, I think I can still see a few copies at the back. You can buy a copy here. Very keen for you to do so. And our distinguished panel of speakers is also extremely keen for you to uh, buy a copy. And I uh, am not to see you walk out without one. And I should just remind you that one of them is trained to kill with his bare hand. <laughs> if we do sell out tonight, there are plenty more copies at the History Group stand at the conference, in the conference centre. Now, our second purpose in organising this meeting is to consider the uses of history for a political party. And here I'm going to use a quote from what one member of our panel, Paddy Ashdown, wrote in his autobiography. Some of you were probably around in 1988-1989. You remember the row about the uh, name of the party, whether it were going to be Social and Liberal Democrats, Democrats, yeah. whatever. Now, at the, towards the end of this story, in July 89, reflecting on the consequences of Paddy's support for the name Democrats, he wrote, Being a relative outsider compared to the older MPs, I had, in my rush to create the new party, fail to understand that a political party is about more than plans and priorities and policies and a chromium-plated organisation. It also has a heart and a history and a soul. And that's really the theme of this meeting. The heart and the history <coughs> and the soul of this party. We've attempted to capture the history of the party in this book and I think we've also managed to portray some of its heart and soul as well. So to discuss all that and to uh, reflect on people's position in history, I'm going to start with our first speaker, um, actually a contributor to our very first book the History Group ever published in 1988, The Dictionary of Liberal Biography, but probably better known now as a Guardian columnist, Julian Butler. And continuing the great tradition of history, this is a meeting without microphones, going back to the way things were. So if you can't hear at the back, try shouting and I'll try and speak louder. Um, I think the importance of history to any party is great, but no more so than to the Liberal Democrats, a party that's sometimes seen by unkind outsiders, occasionally in my own organisation, as a new party. Um, you can't hear? I should try even louder. So the Liberal Democrats are sometimes seen as a new party. They're not. They're a party that draws on a great historical tradition. And I was struck by that when a friend of mine, some time ago, was canvassing in a by-election. I think it was the Christchurch by-election, and they knocked on a door of a house and a voter came down the stairs, an elderly lady, and they said, will you be voting Liberal Democrat? And she looked at the canvasser and she said, I certainly will be. I voted for the last Liberal government and I'm going to keep voting till I vote for the next one. <laughs> <laughs> that, that is a big story. I don't know whether she is still voting in Christchurch. I hope so. Um, but as, whenever you're given a new book, and certainly if you're in politics or, or in journalism, the first thing you do is turn to the index. So I was sent an electronic copy of this book and I went straight to the index. Um, sadly, I wasn't in it. Both of uh, the fellow panelists were, of course. So I thought, well, what's the next best thing? The next best thing is to look for the name of your employer. So I looked up The Guardian and it was there with two or three references. And one of them, a century-old reference, had this quote attached to it. The Manchester Guardian is the conscience of the Liberal Party. Well, I would ask, has anything changed? <laughs> Apart, of course, from the Manchester bit, which sadly we lost sometime before I joined the organisation. The Guardian is, after all, the paper that in May last year ran an editorial just before the election, which some of you might have noticed, telling the world that, quote, the Liberal moment had come. As soon as we did it, we changed our minds. <laughs> 
decided to moan about that dreadful Tory setup, Nick Clegg, but then that's the Guardian for you. And the good side of that is that nobody at least tells us what to do. And in case we ever, at the Guardian, take ourselves too seriously, I should perhaps point out that polling showed that Labour support amongst Guardian readers actually went up uh, among the people who bought the Guardian, despite our very wise words. So maybe our leaders aren't quite taken with the seriousness we'd hoped for, and I've written an awful lot of them, and it's painful to think of that. Well, it took almost a century for The Guardian to get around to endorsing the Liberal Democrats or the Liberals fully after a rather long enthusiasm for the Labour Party. And once in the 1950s, a leader that none of my colleagues mention in the office at all now, although I have a secret copy of it, in which we called on Britain to chuck out Clement Attlee and elect a Tory government. <laughs> That's in 1950, and Britain did. Um, and I hope that it will be less than 100 years before we see The Guardian backing the Liberals again although we have to hold our breath on that one, I think. Um, the judging by some of my colleagues, I really don't think we're likely to see it soon. Still, there's nothing new in that. Uh, I thought before this meeting, I would dig through the archives, 150 years or so of wise Guardian advice to the Liberal Party and its successors. Equally wisely, most of the time, the party's been ignoring our advice. <laughs> <laughs> the following, for instance, isn't from tomorrow's paper or tomorrow's online website but from March 1866, about Earl Russell's liberal administration. And it begins like this, quote, The great liberal party, aware of the growing schism in the cabinet, began to count the days when the rotten fabric will fall to pieces, probably of its own accord. Well, you could say that about any government, of course. Predicting doom is a journalistic standby, not that we will be so lazy these days. <laughs> So skip forward 50 years, we, we move past Gladstone and then we reach the Manchester Guardian, still the Manchester Guardian, in 1906 at an election. And just in passing, looking for the election editorial, I came across this report about a campaign speech by Asquith. And it begins, at this stage there was a considerable interruption and hubbub owing to the action of a woman who occupied the front row of the top gallery at the back of the hall. No change there then from, from great liberal traditions either. She shouted in a shrill voice, is the Liberal Party prepared to give the vote to women? And at the same time displayed a piece of white cloth onto which was inscribed, Votes for Women. There were loud cries of, sit down and throw her out. <laughs> <laughs> and a man sitting nearby seized the flag, tore it into shreds and threw it into the gallery below. <laughs> Asquith, the Guardian reports, continued his speech without mentioning this, which only shows that the Liberal Party has not always been as progressive as perhaps it might have hoped to be. <laughs> In the 1906 election, at least, the Guardian was loyal to the Liberal cause, even if more parochial than the globalised digital Guardian would be today. Our election leader began, Friday, we hope, will begin the building of a Liberal majority in Parliament, and by Saturday, Man Manchester and Salford will have spoken. By 1950, however, the paper was attacking the Liberal Party for putting out a report calling for big spending cuts. So for those of you who worry that Danny Alexander is somehow breaking with tradition, he isn't. <laughs> and the next day, we ran a leader on that same 1950 spending report, which I think really confirmed a Guardian tradition. It said, it has to be feared that the Liberal Party is missing its opportunity. <laughs> oh yes, we've been saying that in different forms ever since. It is what you might call the A moan, or the Model A moan, of leading articles on third party politics, bemoan their failure to back whatever a cause it is the paper has decided to support at the time. Model B, by the way, is to write off the party altogether, as we did in an election leader in 1951, which begins, quote, This election marks the end of the Liberal Party as a force in the electoral field. <laughs> <laughs> Best of all, if we can put Model A and Model B together and praise the party whilst also writing it off, as we did just before the 1987 election with this piece of contradiction from our election leader, these are dire days for the Alliance. They have some of the most thoughtful and radical politicians around. Um, well, some of those thoughtful and radical politicians are here or will be here on the panel today. <laughs> <laughs> and we have one of them here. And in passing... I dug out a 
early Guardian report from 1981, the first, I think, in which Eddie Ashton was mentioned in the Guardian, and in which he, quote, gave a speech in which he attacked personal ambitions. Well, maybe he changed his mind after that. Ambitions? <laughs> <laughs> As a paper, we certainly seem to enjoy nothing more than praising the Liberal Party and the Liberal Democrats, Ooh. while going on to explain why we can't actually support it. <laughs> In 1979, we said the party was the only one to have been all, at all consistent during the campaign, while announcing, quote, the immediate fight for Britain is once again between the Labour Party and the Conservative Party, <laughs> and surprise, surprise, plumping for Labour with a sort of sigh, or doing the same with at least a nod to the possibility of backing the alliance in some places in 1992, the election that I'm sure Paddy might talk about a bit later. Reviewing the 1992 manifesto, as this excellent new book records, we said, the Liberal Democrat essay far outdistances its competitors with a fizz of ideas and an absence of fudge. That didn't mean we actually called for Paddy to become Prime Minister in the pre election editorial that followed. So there you have it, 150 years from the Guardian and the Manchester Guardian, calling on the Liberal Party and the Liberal Democrats to be brave, radical, praising the party's policies, and then writing it off as irrelevant. <laughs> <laughs> I hope that we both last long enough to spend another 150 years doing the same. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Julian. Um, now, if anyone thinks politicians have big egos, I should tell you our two next speakers have been fighting about which one of them will not speak next. <laughs> Possibly because they're not quite ready to give a speech. However, <laughs> your next speaker, please say welcome to the first leader of the Liberal Democrats, Paddy Ashdown. Well, I hope you're enjoying yourself because I'm going to set you all a little test. There is, of course, the famous phrase that those who do not remember history are condemned to repeat it. Um, by the way, Duncan's first quote, and I'd forgotten I'd written that uh, until he began the quote, and then I remembered rather painfully. I mean, it was, I, I, to be honest, it was, yeah, I'd just become leader of this, this um, thing called the social and, what was it called? I can't remember. <laughs> Salads or the slids or something. Um, and in thinking about a new name, I completely ignored, as others in the party did not, that quotient that Duncan just referred to, our soul um, and our history. And that history goes back a very, very long way. Indeed, as I shall try and suggest to you in a moment, actually it is a history that has been relevant in ways that the Tory and Labour Party can't even touch to. Near, near touch um, for more than, well, several thousand years since we start, first started to create what have become known as the European values of humanity and liberalism and internationalism. Um, and so here to try and prove that for you is a little test, et. Here are three quotes from past party leaders. You've got to tell me who they are. The first one is easy. Go back to your constituency <laughs> and prepare for what? What was it? Government. government. <laughs> what did we get? I can't remember, but it certainly wasn't government. The next, which we might go a little bit further back, of course, was March. Troops to the sound of gunfire. March your troops. March my. I intend to march my troops to the sound of gunfire. Who was it? Joe. Joe. Here's the third, which you may find a little more difficult. Ideas are not responsible for the people who believe in them. <laughs> <laughs> who said that? <laughs> Me, when Alex Carlyle did something fucking stupid. <laughs> No, no, that's not true. Actually, it is the only quote. I think it's mine. I'm not sure. I may have borrowed it from somebody else. Um, you could go back a little further. So here is the speech. See if you can guess this one. Um, we are, we are, I suppose, in the 1906 government. 
If I could do it with a Welsh accent, I would do so. <laughs> there has been a great slump in Dukes. <laughs> there has been a great slump in Dukes lately. <laughs> we'll continue. They have been making speeches lately. One especially expensive Duke made a speech. And all the Tory press said, well now really, is that the sort of thing we are spending £25,000 a year on? Because I tell you, two fully equipped dukes cost as much as two dreadnought battleships. And they are just as great a terror, and they last longer. Let them realize what they are doing. They are forcing a revolution, and they will get it. Who was it, of course? Lloyd George, what was the issue? The reform of the House of Lords, and we still haven't got it. God help us, there are still some Liberal Democrats who vote against it. So we will all remember, educated audience that we are, who it was who said, power corrupts and... Absolute power corrupts. Absolute power corrupts, absolutely. Who was it? The great Liberal Lord Acton. Power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. But did you realize that he said this as well? A state which is incompetent to satisfy different races condemns itself. A state which labors to neutralize, to absorb, to expel them, destroys its own vitality. A state which does not include them is destitute of the chief basis of self-government. No, no, that's Acton too. And here's the last one of his, which I adore. I mentioned just we were at a community politics meeting a few moments ago. Acton said this, and it ought to be emblazoned on every community politics leaflet that we have. It is easier to find people fit to govern themselves than it is to find people fit to govern. And he was right. Okay, we can go back a bit further to one of my favourites who made a speech around about that sort of time which began, funny how these come right up to date, isn't it? How our history is part of our present. Who began a speech? Do not forget that the sanctity of life in the hill villages of Afghanistan amongst the winter snows is no less inviolate in the eye of Almighty God as can be your own. Nice. Do not forget that he who built you, who, who caused you as the... Do not forget that the flesh... Oh my God, I can't remember. <laughs> do not forget that he who made you brothers of the same flesh and blood bound you by the laws of love, and that love is not limited to the shores of this island, but it passes across the whole surface of the earth, encompassing the greatest along with the meanest in its unmeasured scope. 1879, Second Midlothian Campaign, Britain at war in Afghanistan. Gladstone, leader of the opposition, about to become Prime Minister, had the moral courage to say to a nation, do not forget that the sanctity of life in the hill villages of Afghanistan is no less inviolate in the eye of Almighty God, as can be your own. Our history is our present. Okay, I'm going to finish now, but with one final speech. See if you can get this one. Here's a speech that goes back I suppose 3,000 years, and probably more. I'm just trying to check my history. But he was indeed, he was not a liberal himself, but he was speaking of the death of a great liberal who may well have founded those great precepts of liberalism upon which I think the European values of humanity, liberty, and freedom are based. And this is what he said at a funeral. Let me say that our system of government does not copy the institutions of our neighbours. It is more the case of our being a model to others than of our imitating anyone else. Our constitution is called a democracy because power is in the hands not of a minority but of the whole people. When it is a question of settling private disputes, Everyone is equal before the law. When it is a question of responsibility, what counts is not membership of a particular class, but the actual ability that a man, he might have added a woman, possesses. 
And just, he said, as our political life is free and open, so is our day-to-day -day life in our relations with each other. We are free and tolerant in our private lives, but in public affairs we keep to the laws because it commands our deep respect. We give our obedience to those whom we put in positions of authority and we obey the laws themselves, especially those which are for the protection of the oppressed. Our love of what is beautiful does not lead to extravagance. Our love of things of the mind does not make us soft. We make friends by doing good to others, not by receiving good from them. When we do kindnesses to others, we do not do them out of any calculation of profit or loss. We do them without afterthought, relying on our free liberality. And this is the one I love. This is the payoff. It's a glory. I declare that in my opinion, each single one of our citizens in all the manifold aspects of life is able to show himself and herself the rightful lord and owner of their own person and to do this moreover with exceptional grace and exceptional versatility. Who? So I will stop there. No, it wasn't. It was the death of Pericles. It was Pericles' funeral oration given by... Thucydides, Thucydides, going right the way back. Now here's the importance, and that will be all I need to say to you. That philosophy, that philosophy of liberalism, that combines a solution to the questions of liberty and freedom, and sometimes, as John Stuart Mill said, they oppose each other, the freedom to and the freedom from. You have to determine where that balance lies for your time, for your nation, and for your generation. It does not lie always in the same place. You have to determine that. That's why liberalism is a living creed. It counts also, as no other philosophy does, the importance of the things we hold in common. That we are not just single individuals. We relate one to another. We belong to each other. In the great words of John Donne, every man's death affecteth me, for I am involved in mankind. Seek not to ask for whom the bell tolls, it tolls for thee. And the third element of liberalism, is that elements of understanding that that community is not just our community, but it encompasses the whole, in our terms, international scene. You know, there is no other philosophy, not Toryism, not socialism, that has an answer to the conundrums of our time, that recognize both the freedom that is conferred on people by the internet and by the new technologies, and also our responsibility to each other in community, and also our sense of internationalism in the wider world. The thing that we have in our, in, our party, in our party title, liberal, goes back thousands of years. You should be proud of that. It should give us strength, and it should make us campaign even harder. If I have a criticism of our party, sometimes it's that we're far too kind, far too nice. This is, this is a radical policy. It's a policy for revolution and for change. Another quote, and my last one. Henry Gibson once said, you do not go out to do battle for freedom and truth wearing your best trousers. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes I think our party wears its best trousers too much. <laughs> this is our heritage, and it's also our message today, and we should be proud of it. Paddy, and so I introduce my third speaker, founder member of the STP, member of the League for <coughs> Shirley Williams. Well, I wish that I'd asked Paddy to speak last, <laughs> because I think it was a wonderful final speech. And it said all that you wanted to hear about the <coughs> idealism of liberalism. I'm going to talk rather more drearily about some of the lessons from history that we mustn't forget. And therefore my speech will be less a marvellous combination, almost like a kind of walking through pictures and an exhibition, to quote a famous composer, 
which showed us one great liberal figure after the other, using the word liberal internationally, widely, and covering a very wide range of people. I'm going to talk about something a bit different, and alas, I fear, not quite as inspirational. My husband, uh, my late husband, used to teach a class at Harvard called Uses of History. It was an attempt to try to teach a completely <coughs> and historically educated generation of students about what you could learn from history. History hardly appeared in American school syllabuses. In many cases, it simply wasn't taught, with the single exception of the American War of Independence. It had quite a lot to do with the way in which, to this day, Republicans think of the world's ending at the coast of the United States, a kind of medieval view of the world, where the monsters begin, where the beaches end. But nevertheless, it was crucial for the young Americans who were going to go on to become leaders of their country, whether they were in the legislature or in the legislatures of the states or in the military or whatever it was, something about the lessons of history. So my husband used to teach them about the war in Vietnam and the message that came through from that about the impossibility of bombing a people, especially a cohesive people, into a system they didn't believe in, which tried to show them what would happen if you simply used force and the way in which if you use force you often consolidate a population rather than splitting it and fragmenting it. And that lesson was learned for a relatively short period of time. And 30 years later, when the decision was taken to evade Iraq, it was fundamentally forgotten. Yet many of the lessons of Vietnam reoccurred in the aftermath of the invasion of Iraq, and did so with the same devastating consequences, not just for civilians, but for the world's settlement and its ability to accept the idea of peace rather than war. He also used to teach them quite a lot about the Great Depression, about the way in which in the 19, late 1920s and early 1930s, the United States had slipped into a depression so deep that for many, many years, unemployment in that country was well above 20%. Then there was another lesson. He didn't teach it. We read it. And that was the lesson of a hundred years ago. I was reading in the train coming up a book which is called The Strange Death of Liberal England by George Dainsfield. And it revolves above all around the year 1911. <coughs> and it shows the way in which an extraordinarily powerful Liberal Party, one that had dominated most of the previous century, <coughs> one bejeweled by the people to whom Paddy has referred, collapsed within a matter of a few years, back into being at first a lesser member of the coalition, and then after that into being a party that warred between itself, between the national liberals and the ones who refused to become national liberals, and meant that the great liberal party was reduced in the years after the Second World War to at best a shadow of its former self. And what kept it going was essentially the deep roots it had put down in some parts of the country, the Pennines, parts of the West Country, and of course the Celtic, Welsh and Scottish Liberals, which held on the party after it had largely lost any serious presence in London, the South East or the Midlands. And that was took a very long time to be resurrected. It's proper, I think, that we should pay tribute to David Steele, who put together the Liberal Party after the desperate consequences of Jeremy Thorpe's scandal. And I must say, those of us who are part of the Liberal Democrats owe a huge debt of gratitude to this militant man. <laughs> party which he rightly described as being in intensive care and then holding it together long enough to actually produce the largest number of MPs that the party had had for about 40 years. An amazing achievement. 
and one that was so improbable. Because when my colleagues in the coalition, the Conservative colleagues, chatter about sandal-wearing, carrot-chewing liberals, <laughs> I always say to them, yes, I'm led by Paddy Ashton, and they shut up. <laughs> <laughs> He wears bare feet but never sandals, <laughs> only in his palace in France. <laughs> and Paddy also has never been known to chew a carrot that I know of. <laughs> if he chews anything, it's probably something much more sinister than a carrot. <laughs> <laughs> but let me go back to the. But let me go back for a moment to those two periods of great crisis for the Liberal Party. And you know that I came not from the Liberal Party, but from the Social Democrats. And I suppose the difference between Social Democrats and Liberals is that the Social Democrats are rather less distrustful of the power of the state than traditionally Liberals have been. It doesn't matter so much anymore. But I think we've begun to realise that there are areas where the market can be effective, but also areas where it is not effective at all, where it isn't actually what ought to be the guiding principle. And whether that's health or railways, it's something well worth bearing in mind. Let me go back. First, then, the lessons of the 1930s. I'm troubled by that. I don't pretend I'm not. I think sometimes that we in the coalition should be thinking at least a bit about the possibility of a job creations program directed especially at young people if we find that we need to go ahead and create rather more stimulus in the economy. I think that would be something that would be very important to think about doing if we find we have room to make some little dent in the necessary and important exercise of breaking down the deficit. I myself would be only too happy to see perhaps some dedicated temporary tax to make that possible, to start infrastructure projects largely for young people in some of our more uh, depressed regions. The 1930s I'm reminded of all the time because one of the things which, thank God, we've got this <coughs> capable for is not to simply accept that we have to take the dictation of the market without any question about whether it's right or whether it isn't. The strange thing about the 1930s is for so long, government simply sat down under it and treated what was happening as being an act of inevitability and the only leader of the Western world who decided that this wouldn't do was, of course, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, who, in making extraordinarily radical changes, brought about the gradual recovery of this country, and more important, brought about a liberal democratic government, which was no longer threatened by what at the time was an extremely irrational and in many ways, emotional right wing. That was the 30s. Here we are 70 years later, and we see President Obama meeting exactly the same sort of thing. <coughs> An irrational, dogmatic attitude, which says that nothing can be done to change the situation, and if it is done, then it should be stopped and repealed and rolled backwards. It's a very great worry about the United States. <coughs> that Obama cannot get any agreement about how to deal with the present economic problem. When you worry about our situation as being part of the coalition, let me tell you a very quick story. I think it's well known that I wasn't at all happy about the coalition, unlike my great former leader. I didn't want to see a coalition. What I wanted to see was a minority supply government, a conservative one, which we would sustain by voting for the necessary, uh, necessary supply, but we would not be connected to the, the laws passed by that parliament, because you're not in that situation. I thought that I was right until I went back to the United States, where, as some of you know, I was for 10 years a professor at the Kennedy School of Harvard. And then I saw what happens if you have total polarization and you cannot overcome it, even in a situation of serious crisis. What happens is that in the end, a democracy cannot deal with the challenges that confront it. Why are all countries 
so the United States have had to go through the process of seeing its credit rating reduced from three ends to a secondary status, not because of the economics. The United States is still substantially better off than most of Europe, but because the political system failed, became gridlocked, became unable to come up with any constructive ideas at all. And that made me think that hard would it be for me and many others to swallow down a coalition with a Conservative Party that I'd spent most of my life fighting. In this particular situation, it was necessary and it was right. And that's why I think on that particular lesson from the 1930s, I came to the conclusion that one had to make the political system work, even if it was painful and difficult to do so, and even if it didn't last forever. It didn't last forever, because one of the advantages we had over our long ago colleagues in the 1930s in the Liberal Party is, of course, in their case, they were being slowly overcome by the growth of the Labour Party, and they were divided among themselves because they'd never quite decided which side of the argument they were on. Let me turn next to 1911 and say very directly <coughs> that 1911, I think, expressed a failure of the Liberal Party. It wasn't surprising that it led, not as it happens, as we now know, to the death of liberalism in England, but certainly to a very long period of recession. And let me take the three examples that came out of George Dainsfield's book. The first of those examples was what he called the Women's Rebellion. I'll be quite blunt. It was <coughs> a poem that Asquith <coughs> consistently refused to consider a suffrage for women. How could it be that a great liberal leader, and here I don't wholly share the view of my great colleague, Lloyd Jenkins, <coughs> could actually, year <coughs> after year <coughs> after year, refuse to even consider giving women a vote? How is it that in our own party today, a 5% drop from where we were in the 2010 general election would wipe all but two of our women members off the House of Commons altogether. We are not a good party on this issue. We are still massively male-dominated. I don't mind if they're good men. <laughs> but what we haven't realized is that unless we take a much more serious view in our local parties, about the need for women candidates who are good, and we've got some brilliant ones, and incidentally also <coughs> ethnic minority candidates, we're going to look at a party which is more and more unrepresentative of the people that it seeks to represent. It really matters that there are virtually no women MPs with anything resembling a safe seat, and there are not enough women candidates being selected and chosen throughout our country in the way that they should have been. What happened? We produced a radical idea. It was the idea of zipping for the European Parliament. Do you remember? The party agreed that if there was, for example, a male incumbent for the European Parliament, then under PR, the next person should be a woman, then a man, then a woman, with the result that only in Europe did we get anywhere near a broad parity of gender. We never chose to do anything of the kind within Westminster, we could have done. We could have clubbed together constituencies and said to them all, among you all, you've got to decide that there'll be a woman candidate because we don't approve them until you do. None of that, with the result that we are the most unfeminist party in Westminster of all the four major parties, and I'm including in that, the SNP. It's not going to serve us well in the future. We're going to look more and more uncharacteristic and people like me will pass away and we'll be stuck with almost no women who can put up the front and say, look, we are a party of both genders. I look at this audience, <coughs> you're a wonderful audience, you're almost all white, that's also a serious problem. If we look at our conference right now, it is overwhelmingly white. Now, I'm all for white men and women, but I'm also all for men and women of other races Paddy gave you a wonderfully inspired quote from that great man or actor, a liberal. And there's something wrong in a situation where we have got fewer candidates from the ethnic minority groups in our country than either of the other parties in the House of Commons. 
it really isn't sufficient for us to get up and make wonderful marks about equality, liberty, all the rest of it, and in practice not carry it out. And we are not carrying it out. And we have to carry it out because we are now, rightly in my view, a multi-community, multi-racial community, and so we should be. And the record we've had in the past, which has been good in terms of accepting migrants from other countries, is beginning to fall apart in terms of our own behaviour as a party. The other thing about 1911, the first was the women's suffrage, where I think Asquith badly let the party down. The second was what was called the Workers' Rebellion. The Workers' Rebellion was about, above all, a fall in the real value of wages. Between 1910 and the coming of the First World War, there was a dramatic drop in the real value of wages. And it's in the book, you can read it for yourself. We are seeing right now the beginning of a dramatic drop in the real value of wages. And that's why what Liberal Democrats are trying to do, by insisting, for example, on taxation being taken off the most poor, and it's appalling that we live in a country where tax starts, <coughs> and you're earning just over £8,000 a year. For God's sake, how are you supposed to keep a couple of kids on two of you earning 8000 a year? And then you're taxed on top of it. So it's right to address that, and we should make much more of it than we do. And more, too, of keeping the 50% and beginning to tackle the ludicrous inequalities in wealth and income in our own country, about which Vince spoke today. Let me again give you one example. When I first got elected to Parliament, I'm very old, so it was right back in 1964, when Paddy was still in nappies. <laughs> <laughs> the ratio between the pay of people who were leading chief executives of what were then the FTSE companies, and the average wage, not the bottom wage, the average wage of the people who worked in manufacturing was approximately 8 to 1, a ratio of 8 to 1. I checked up the other day on the current ratio and it's over 80 to 1. 80 to 1. In the United States it's over 120 <coughs> to 1. Now that's just not inequality. That's appalling obscenity. It's simply shocking that in a democracy we can have differences that are that great. And in the end, the mortar of democracy, and we understand it as a party, is about social justice and fairness. How can one possibly argue that it's fair for one man and one woman to have one eightieth of what another man and another woman has? Because it simply destroys society in the end. You do not have any common interest left. So the lesson, I think, from 1911 that second issue about the decline in real wages, which the Liberal Party at that time never seriously addressed, is one we are, I think, beginning to seriously address. And I was delighted by Vincent's speech today. But we're only beginning, let's get it straight, we're only beginning because it has grown <coughs> so rapidly over the last 20 or 30 years. The final one, and I'll end with this, because it's a lovely story. The final element in the death or the attempt to death, thank God. Yes, there's been a recovery. I suppose you could always call it a resurrection. But the final element in that death of Liberal England was, of course, the usual total mess <coughs> the United Kingdom has now made for centuries in Ireland. We'd learned painfully and with great difficulty, and I do have to pay tribute both to Tony Blair, also to the often forgotten John Major, mm -hmm in the way in which they put together, once again, a possible reconciliation for Ireland, which has worked brilliantly for the South, and is still painfully making its way through the North, from which Paddy comes, uh, painfully making its way through, because still it seems awful difficult for the North to swallow the sectarian divisions, which have largely gone now in the South. But that, if you go back long enough in liberal history, was addressed by, I think, probably the greatest liberal leader of the 19th century, William Gladstone. What you may not, of course, really be will realize was that Gladstone called for home rule for Ireland decades before anybody took him seriously. And long after he had died, did we ever really address that issue again. 
with huge loss of life and trust and property and all the rest of it. And it's taken a very long time to get back from the worst colonial story of the United Kingdom to the point where we are now. But what you don't know, this is where I'll finish. Five years or six years ago, I went to look at the, I went with friends to look at the Zulu battlefields of KwaZulu in South Africa. They're dramatic battlefields. They're battlefields about the war, initially between the Zulu people and the British army, and then subsequently between the Zulu people and the Boers pressing northwards across the Transvaal, to the Transvaal more precisely. There is a, an inscription on one of the cemeteries, the grave stones there, which tells us something I never knew before. That's amazing. And that is that W.E. Gladstone offered the leader of the Zulus an alliance for them together to beat the Boers coming north in order to establish themselves in the northern parts of South Africa. Gladstone offered them a military alliance and the support of the British Army for doing precisely that. It fell apart because he himself ceased to be Prime Minister. But think for a moment what history would have been like if Gladstone's mission had been carried out then too, in a way that would have been quite remarkable for the world, and would have brought, I think, multiracial in South Africa at least half a century earlier. What an amazing man we have in the history of this country. But the lessons to be learned are not just about the amazing men and women in the history of this country, but also that we must learn the lessons, even the painful ones, and not make the same mistakes again. Yeah. Shirley, we've got about 10 or 15 minutes for questions, but before we go on to that, I'm just going to tell you a bit of information about the Lib Dem History Group that's organised this meeting. We do three things. We publish the Journal of Liberal History. This is the latest version, um, just out before conference. A special issue on the history of the Liberal Party in coalition. And if you think we're in trouble now in this coalition, you should read some of the historical things. <laughs> uh, it's a quarterly. Uh, if you subscribe now, you'll get this issue and the next four. We organise meetings like this one, uh, and also meetings in London. The next meeting we are organising is on the 23rd of January next year in uh, the National Liberal Club in London. It is the 50th anniversary of the Orpington by-election next year. So we are remembering what happened to Orpington man and woman. Uh, and we publish books like this one, Peace, Reform and Liberation, our latest one. Uh, if you visit our stand in the conference center, you can also see uh, our early ones, Great Liberal Speeches, and the Dictionary of Liberal Thought, which includes entries on everyone that Paddy talked about, including Thucydides. Uh, and we're also carrying copies of uh, the biography of Richard Wainwright, just published by Matt Cole, who is sitting around there somewhere. Um, very good book. Um, if you subscribe to the journal, if you join the history group, which is only £20 a year, you will get 20% discount off all our books and our shorter booklets, so if you buy all of them, you can find that you've saved more money than you've just spent on subscription. <laughs> so that's a good one. And uh, our stand is in the conference center right next to the entrance to the auditorium. You can't miss it. So I hope to see you there. And so we'll be selling copies of this book there if we uh, sell it tonight. Who wrote that book? Uh, which one? This is the current one. It's uh, different authors for each chapter. It's edited by me and my co-editor, Robert Ingham. But you have quite a range of uh, eminent historians and people who've been around the party for quite some time. Uh, contributing a different chapter for each period. Okay, who would like to put a question to any of our speakers? Right, I'll take uh, groups of three, um, starting with David at the back. Now please introduce yourself and shout. I'm David Boyle. Um, I, I was born in 1960, in, um, I was six in 1964 when Shirley was first elected. And I find as I get older I feel more and more Gladstonian myself. Um, so I was wondering what, whether as well as defending peace, reform and liberation, which we could all uh, go through on the nod, whether you could defend those Gladstonian values of thrift and voluntarism. Okay, thank you. Put them in front. Right, I'm going to stand up and shout. John Calvert, City of Nottingham. I think two points you've taken up. We must avoid the errors of 1924 and 1931. 
both cases we were supporting a local government. We were 1923 and 1931. We were giving support to a Labour government without actually putting an input into the thing. And then with the Zominoff lecture and the rest of it, which the fact we switched support and we seemed to change our mind, lost over 100 seats. Uh, 1931, we stopped the way of splitting three ways. Okay. And Gladstone gave the G-lines back to Greece, another upside thought it thought. Great, next job, avoiding the errors of 1924 and 1931. And uh, another speaker here. Yes. Um, you have to stand up and shout. And okay, you. then. Uh, this is really for the whole panel. Do you feel that if the numbers have added up and if uh, the Labour Party was one that got 300 seats in the 2010 elections and the Liberal Democrats went into coalition with them, that they'd be doing as badly in the opinion polls as they are doing now? Good question. Good question. Thanks very much. Okay, Paddy, would you like to go first? Yeah. Um, David Boyle and Thrift and Volunteers and Yeah. I'm oh, sorry, I beg your pardon, yeah, we do. Um, David Boyle on Thrift and Volunteerism, and by the way, um, let me just say that you know, I thought Shirley was so much on the button when she reminded us not just of the glories of liberalism but also the dangers. Uh, and I, I just hope we take those messages to heart. Um, and recognise the truth of what she was saying there. Let me just come back to thrift. Yeah, I think they are, absolutely, David, translated. Well, what is thrift? I mean, what are we saying when we talk about environmental protection? It says be thrifty about the use of our resources, make sure we use them effectively, <coughs> live lightly on the earth. And so I think that is translatable into the modern age precisely. And volunteerism, well, community politics is based on that. The fact about community politics, I sometimes think that we use it as an electoral technique instead of, as we were discussing in the previous fringe, actually part of our philosophy. It's about giving people power. That great line of Gladstone's, which is on the wall of the National Liberal Club as you go in, liberalism is trust of the people <coughs> tempered by wisdom, Toryism <coughs> is mistrust of the people uh, modified by, driven by fear. Well, of course, none in the present coalition of the Tories. That's what it's about. So yes, I think we are indeed. Um, I think we are indeed. Uh, those those values are liberal values that come through into the modern age. On the second question, would we? The question was, would we be in the same position today? Do you know, I I, I can't say. Like Shirley, I was very doubtful about the coalition. Um, because, like Shirley, I'd spent my time fighting the Tories under Thatcher. Um, like Shirley, and if you take them, Shirley, Charles, Ming, myself, um, we're all very, very nervous about this. Um, it, it took me about three hours, Shirley probably less, because she's quicker than me to decide it was nevertheless a good thing. And therefore, I have supported and continue to support it. I think Nick's judgment on this was spot on. And those of us who'd lived and opposed Toryism through the Thatcher years had not understood the nature of some of the changes, which have surprised me about the things that Tories now believe in, like you know, civil partnerships um, that we heard the other day, like, for instance, localism, which they appear to be serious about, although not to the extent that we would wish. So, I, I don't know. I, I, I wonder whether that <coughs> Labour Party, a Labour Party that had lost the will to govern, lost its way, lost its enthusiasm, almost had a death wish. I did all I could to try and encourage them to come up with a sensible proposition, and they radically, they, abs they comprehensively failed to do it. Uh, the arrogance of Labour at that stage was appalling, appalling, and then you were dealing with them head on. So, I, I mean, I'd like to think that it would have been easier. I'd like to think it would have been successful, but if I look rationally and coldly at the last year and at what Labour was and what it's done since, I'm not sure I was right. I think it might have been worse, frankly, frankly than some of the things we're currently having to do. Worse. But who knows? So what would have happened to this of history? Um, can I tell a story? Yes, <laughs> please. There's a lovely story about Mao Tse Tung. A friend of mine was, um, was, was a Chinese, I learned Chinese with him. And uh, he was Kissinger's interpreter during the famous, uh, the end of the Pink Pong diplomacy. Kissinger flew to Peking, um, and Mao called for him, as Mao always called for people at about two o'clock in the morning. And my friend was translating for, for Kissinger, and they appeared before Chairman Mao. And Kissinger wanted to put this conversation into 
the context of not the Secretary of State visiting the Chairman of the People's Republic of China, but one historian to another. So Kissinger's opening remark was, Mr. Chairman, I've always been fascinated by whether what would have happened if of history. What do you think would have happened, he said to Mao, uh, what do you think would have happened if the man who was assassinated in 1962 was, it was not John F. Kennedy, but Nikita S. Khrushchev? To which Mao thought for a moment and said, do you know, I don't think that nice, rich Greek ship owner would have married Mrs. Khrushchev. Thank you very much, Shirley. And of course, Mao's other famous remark was the one about uh, what do you think about the consequences of the French Revolution, to which he replied, it's too early to say. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let, me, let me look at the, the, the couple of questions that have been asked. Um, thrift and voluntarism, thrift. I think one of the things that's quite interesting is that we're now as a country going through a kind of cultural recognition of how far the last four years were completely unreal. Mm -hmm. The years between 2007 and 2011. Unreal for a country which had got the highest household debt, as Vince said earlier today, of any country in the whole of the Western world. We, it wasn't just, as it were, a national piece of absurdity. It was also, let's be honest, an individual piece of absurdity. We all lived on debt. We all hoped that the value of our occupied houses would go up and up and up, and therefore we could borrow against an expectation of them increasing. And of course what's happened is you can still do that if you're very wealthy, and if your houses are very expensive. But God help you if you live in Belton in a semi, and you're waiting for your debts to be paid off by the value of your house increasing. It won't. It isn't. It's going in the other direction. So one of the things that we, I think, are beginning to discover again about thrift is that it leaves people with a much greater, less sense of anxiety. Ask yourself the curious question, why do international estimates and graphs and all the rest of it show terrible factors that British children are among the most unhappy in the wealthy world? And I think one of the reasons for that is that their parents are more driven by anxiety than parents appear to be in continental Europe, or for that matter in Australia or Canada, the only other country that has <coughs> desperately anxious children is the United States, and it too lives on the edge of a debt abyss a lot of the time. So thrift may in fact, curiously, in the end, make us somewhat more happy than we are now, mm -hmm. and certainly is likely to make our children more happy, as we begin to realise, to make a joke of it, that we shouldn't rule out conkers on the ground that they're not safe. <laughs> they are a wonderfully inexpensive toy, provided for us by nature. <laughs> the other question, the question about voluntarism, I think is quite central to what some of us are trying to do with regard to the National Health Service. And I'll give you one example, because it's not an example of privatisation, which we're all worried about, and I think we may have headed it off. There are about the marvellous results of the hospice movement, which has given to elderly people in the last years of their life a quality of life at a cost which is infinitely higher in the first case and infinitely lower in the second case. Because hospices are less expensive than geriatric wards in expensive foundation trust hospitals. And the experience of people in them is in almost every single case far, <coughs> far better. And that's an element of voluntarism. It's not about profit. It's actually about that old-fashioned value that Paddy was talking about community politics. <coughs> that we're members one of another, and that together we can more successfully provide decent lives for those among us who are dependent than by going for huge status, or for that matter, huge private corporatist solutions. So I think that that's a very important part of the answer to that particular question. I'll turn up a little bit for just another moment to what Paddy said about the lessons. I think one of the lessons about coalition and I've long believed that it's a different set of knowledge that you need to be in a coalition government than you do in a government where we are usually in opposition. The lesson we learned about being normally in opposition is that you dig in, you put your roots down, you get real community pavement politics working, and at the end of the day you aren't rooted out when the tsunami comes, you're still there. 
electorate. But in a coalition, it's different. And I think what we're now learning is that we need to get in at the earliest possible moment. We need to look at what the proposals are from ourselves and also from our Conservative partners. If we don't like them, then we should start the process of discussing them and arguing them and negotiating about them, not halfway down the track, as sadly has happened with the NHS, though we've rescued, I think, something from the shambles. But right at the very beginning, you make yourselves difficult, you make yourselves uh, abrasive, you continually press what you think the changes should be at every level, in every way, first privately, and then, if necessary, publicly, and at the end of the day, you settle for what you can agree on that is the best you can get out of the discussion between the two of you. If I may give an example, it's like a very lively but somewhat strained marriage. And that's not a bad analogy. What we can't do, and what I'm afraid we sometimes do still do, is to take the view that we are the Liberal Democrats, we are the minority partner in the coalition, and our job is to march through the lobbies without thought. We've got to go back to thinking about We've got to go back to discussing it within the party, within the party that you are in the country, with the party, the parliamentary parties, and have those discussions, tough as they are, from the very beginning. It's a lesson the Germans have learned, it's a lesson the Scandinavians have learned, it's a lesson we are painfully learning. And it isn't an enemy of the coalition to not simply <coughs> accept what comes to us and adopt it and go through <coughs> the lobbies, driven by the whips. That will only last a short time. What matters is the concept, the belief in negotiation leading ultimately to consensus which enables us to govern more sensibly than the Conservatives would certainly do on our own. And of course it sometimes means swallowing down things you don't much like and keeping the company of people you're not wild about, but it's the way to go. And one more comment which I address rather horribly I mean, to Julian. One of the things that Paddy was talking about the Labour Party, I think the Labour Party's record is very mixed. In some things it was good. Much more expenditure on education, uh, much more on short staff and things of that kind, more money in the last little while for health, uh, and in some cases I think uh, quite a good record on things to do with uh, disablement and so forth. But on the other side you had this huge level of bureaucratic interference. You had this endless micromanagement. You had this involvement in the public services with ministers continually double-guessing what should be done, <coughs> driving teachers and doctors and others into a state of near hysteria about the level of constant interference that their lives went through. But there was also, in some cases, an extraordinary level of commitment to not the best, but the worst of the private sector. And what I have to say, with great respect to Julian, who I think writes marvellous leaders, is that The Guardian has got to be more honest than it's been so far about the record of the Labour government, about what was good and what was mistaken and what was actually bad, like the running up of all this debt over the last few years. And when it does that, more of us will go back to reading it with satisfaction again. I always read The Guardian, but I increasingly get really angry until I get to the leader and I feel better again. <laughs> Surprising with The Guardian, you talk to politicians of all parties and they all say, it annoys me, and, and maybe that's one of the historic roles of The Guardian, um, but I think there is truth that the paper needs to remember its liberal identity as well as its Labour identity, and it perhaps hasn't done that always very much recently. Um, just on the, on the two points, on David's point, it sounds like the Gladstone recipe was entirely for the coalition, it's a mixture of the big society and Danny Alexander's um, austerity, um, so perhaps no change there. And on what would have happened if there had been a coalition with Labour? Well, if the Liberal Democrats had dared to keep Jordan Brown as Prime Minister after the nation had rejected him, it would be calamitous for the party now. Gordon Brown, as you could tell from even Alistair Darling's book, a book by somebody who started off as loyal to him, uh, would not have been a fit to be Prime Minister. The markets would have punished the government immediately. We might not like the markets, but they're out there, and the markets have priced in a Conservative victory, and the coalition reassured them after that. 
and finally, The Guardian would be horrible to the Liberal Democrats anyway. It wouldn't have made any difference at all. We'd still be the same. And what we'd be saying instead of, uh, why don't you stop the evil Tories, is we'd be saying you're stopping the wonderful Labour Party from doing its things. So, however awkward your fate feels at the moment, I assure you, it's a lot better, and it's better, I think, for the country than the alternative. Thank you. Oh, Look, I'm sorry just to come in again, so I know you've got another... You, you want to call it a halt, I think, I think we all There's a it. couple more still. Now, I just want to pick up on this voluntarism thing, because I don't think it's been properly made. <coughs> the danger of voluntarism is it is the same as the big society. You know, and the big society is a, is a good idea, but it's a very small idea. It's a tiny idea. The idea is that you spread around goodwill and voluntary work. That's not the same as we're proposing. We're talking about spreading power. Mm. That's something, you know, this is a subversive doctrine, <laughs> not voluntarism. I mean, voluntarism is perfectly fine. I like people to volunteer, especially if they volunteer for something that I'm interested in. <laughs> <laughs> but actually, it is much more dangerous to say, we trust you, we're going to give you power, you make your own decisions about the governance of your own society at the community level, even if you do things I don't like. I'm prepared to go along with the principle you should do it. It's much bigger than just voluntarism. Let's not get this confused. I'm just going to take two more questions as long as they're really quick. Uh, yes, against the back. Yeah, we'll end up. Uh, do you have any reflections on whether the Liberal Party in the late 19th and early 20th century <coughs> could have done more to embrace the demands of the emerging industrial workers in the north of England and the Midlands in particular, and perhaps prevented the development of the Labour Party at all. Paddy's talked a lot about Gladstone's vision in terms of Afghanistan and Ireland and so on, but did he take his eye off the ball of the emerging demands of the, of the industrial working power? Thanks very much, and lady right at front. I was wondering if, um, Shirley, you thought there was a relationship between the low um, number of female candidates we have now and um, Asquith's attitude back um, in the day. Is there a relationship between Asquith's attitude to women's suffrage and our lack of women MPs and candidates now? Okay, Julian, I'll just, just answer maybe the first question. Uh, yes, I think the party could have done it differently. It didn't. And one of the reasons was because it represented the wrong kind of people and it had the wrong kind of people in it. It was a party partly of the aristocracy. It still had some of its Whig traditions and it wasn't in many ways a party of the people, although it felt it spoke for the people. And as we've heard this evening, I think there are lessons for all parties in British politics about that now. Um, you just have to look at the front bench of both parties, but particularly the coalition in the Commons on a day of, uh, of questions to sometimes wonder whether that really is democracy and a representation of the people. So I would recommend changing on that. And on the second question, surely you can answer, but yes, I would have thought, again, there is a link. Sure. Yes, it's a, it seems to be a sort of persistent weakness in the Liberal Party. Better in the SDP, actually. Um, what I have to say is I think that there's a real quarrel here between localism and certain necessities. Because we have always respected, or almost always respected, local decisions about who should be the candidate. And on the whole, what happens is that more men turn up at the meetings to do that than women do. Sometimes because the women have got kids to look after, so the men can't. What you then get is this extraordinary bias within our party towards male parliamentary candidates especially for the better seats. Incidentally, there's a very striking statistic which shows that women in the Liberal Democrats almost invariably fight <coughs> seats which are much more marginal than the same seats in the proportion of men who fight them. They get the better seats. And so you've got a lot of women who are just there. Um, a number of our women MPs, some are very good ones, will go, as I've said, if there's even quite a small swing. How does one get over that? I think you have to think out devices like the one I suggested, where you take a group of seats which are broadly equally winnable, and you say to them, you've got to select your candidates together, and they've got to be one woman for we agree to the other three. That will make men actually start looking for good women, as they did, by the by, when it came to zipping for the European parliamentary election. Men came pouring in saying, Mrs. So-and-so will be a brilliant candidate because she was going to be the next one in the PR list and then be the third one. You've got to get men harnessed behind the idea of having more women MPs yeah. and, above all, more ethnic minority MPs. Not easy. Thanks very much. Patty. 
I'm not sure that it is true. I mean, look, I have I've come to the conclusion that we are going to have to do some engineering to get this right. I think this is such a failure for our government, for our party, um, that the old argument which I heard men, frankly, I have to confess I subscribed to as well, I think I was wrong, um, that it was somehow illiberal, somehow, we said it, I don't know if you heard the Guardian debate, but we, there's quite a lot of discussion on it then, and I have concluded that actually we just can't continue to call ourselves a liberal party unless we resolve this issue. And therefore, some mechanism of engineering an outcome, at least as a temporary mechanism, mm -hmm. until women have their, and of course, ethnic minorities um, are, are properly represented in our parliamentary party. I don't think it's entirely true, surely, and let's just recognize the difference between ourselves and Labour and the Tories. We don't have winnable seats, by <laughs> uh, at least maybe Yeovil's one, and maybe, but there are very, very few winnable seats, as there are in the Tory party and Labour party. <coughs> by and large, if you win a seat, You've been out there campaigning. You've, you know, you're going to have distributed 100,000 focuses, or the local constituency isn't going to consider you. Uh, and you've been engaged in local community politics. And inevitably, in the way that our society is structured, it's easier for men to do that over a long period than for women, for reasons you understand and know. Uh, so those are the reasons. I think the reasons. You know, I think we have to accept that we have a more difficult problem to overcome than either the Tory or the Labour Party in this, on this issue, but that's not an excuse for overcoming it. Uh, and therefore, I do think now the time has come. I gather there's a, a leadership program launched if it works fine, but if it isn't, then I think we are going to have to resort as a temporary measure to some <coughs> mechanism that engineers an outcome more acceptable and less shaming than the one we have at present. Well, in that context, I might just mention that our next publication, which we hope to have ready by the Spring Conference in Newcastle next year, <coughs> is a pamphlet on famous women liberals in history, uh, and liberal democrats and social democrats, of course. So you might be interested in looking at that. Right, then we now see to close the meeting. Um, Conrad Russell argued that the British Liberal Party, and by extension its successor, ourselves, the Lib Dems, is probably the oldest, liberal, uh, oldest political party in the world. And that three and a half centuries of history is something we've tried to capture in the book. And it's really something that's at the heart of what this group, the Liberal Democrat History Group, tries to do. To remember that history, to celebrate it, and to learn from it. And with your support, we aim to carry on doing that. Thanks to all our speakers, thanks to you for coming, and see you next time.